without any further introduction, because um, he doesn't need it, and anyway, it's in your program, may I ask Jasper Dillon to speak first? Well, thank you very much, Sir Richard. Um, Richard Lord and I are going to talk about anti-suit injunctions in support of London arbitration. And whilst Richard is going to discuss the discretionary factors that may be relevant, I'm going to focus on the issues of jurisdiction to grant an anti-suit injunction. I have to admit a degree of trepidation in speaking before Richard Lord, having read, as I'm sure most of you have, last week's uh, Lawyer magazine, uh, Richard's soaring rhetoric in a speech on climate change, which uh, quoted uh, from, amongst others, Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, and the well-known reggae musician Peter Tosh. Unfortunately for you, the subject matter of my talk today doesn't lend itself to citations to political or musical titans of the 20th century. So I'm going to have to confine myself to citation to uh, the English Commercial Court. But I await with great interest to see who Richard Lord is going to quote today. Now, the particular problem that I'm going to discuss arises when a party uh, seeks an anti-suit injunction restraining foreign proceedings in uh, breach of an English arbitration agreement in circumstances where the relevant clause, the dispute resolution clause, includes both a submission to the jurisdiction of a court as well as a reference to arbitration. Now, this problem is encountered more and more frequently, and it gives rise to very difficult issues because every party needs to know uh, when a dispute arises, do I need to litigate or do I need to arbitrate? And what can be done in order to enforce the obligation to litigate or arbitrate if there is one? Now, the Commercial Court has recently considered the correct approach to adopt in interpreting these mixed dispute resolution clauses, uh, and this is a case that I'm going to focus on called Perkins and Godard, which I think will be of interest to all commercial litigators. Now, the facts of Godard can be summarised relatively briefly. Perkins uh, is and was a uh, UK company, an English company, which was the wholly owned subsidiary of uh, the well-known US company, Caterpillar, which is, as many of you know, the world's, one of the world's leading suppliers of gas and diesel engines. Now, Godard uh, was actually, there were two parties. One was uh, Mr. Godard and also uh, a Lebanese uh, entity. And between them, they had been, since 1990, the sole distributor of Caterpillar engines in the Lebanon. And the party's relationship was governed by a written distributor agreement. Now, the dispute arose uh, when Godard admitted that in 2017, it had sold a number of engines and parts supplied under the distributor agreement by Caterpillar into Syria. Now, this was particularly problematic for uh, Caterpillar as a US company because it was arguable that those sales were contrary to US law, prohibiting uh, all sorts of American technology and equipment going to Syria. So in March 2018, Perkins terminated the distributor agreement on the ground that the Syrian sales amounted to a breach of the distributor agreement. And then in April of that year, Gadar responded by commencing proceedings in uh, the Lebanon against Perkins and claiming damages under what was a mandatorily applicable provision of Lebanese law that applied to uh, agents or representatives. And then in May, uh, Perkins then responded to those proceedings by issuing a notice of arbitration, referring the relevant dispute to arbitration in London, and then also issuing a, an arbitration claim in the commercial court seeking anti-suit injunctive relief restraining the Lebanese proceedings. And I think because of the nature of the arguments, it's useful to have a, a, a look at the relevant clause. And there are two paragraphs of the 
of the clause. The first paragraph you can see contains, in the words underlined, a submission to the jurisdiction of the English court, and it's uh, notable for reasons which I'll explain uh, later in the talk that, uh, uh, that the clause is not stated to be exclusive. And then the second paragraph, which uh, the, the, the court focused on, uh, the dispute before the court focused on, is uh, a, a, a submission to arbitration, but that is, uh, that submission to arbitration, uh, arbitration held in London, England, is only applicable uh, if the words uh, underlined uh, are uh, themselves not applicable. And that's what I'm going to call the proviso, the proviso being that there's no reciprocal enforcement procedures between the UK and the relevant country, in this case, uh, Lebanon. So the issues in the case or well, the critical issue in the case, was what was the true meaning of the proviso? Uh, when we come back to the argument, I'll flick back to the clause so you can all have that uh, in mind. But what was the true meaning of the proviso to the arbitration agreement in the second paragraph of the clause? Now, if there were no relevant enforcement procedures between the UK and Lebanon, then the arbitration agreement is engaged and prima facie Perkins was entitled to an anti-suit injunction. But if there are such procedures, then the arbitration agreement was not engaged, no anti-suit injunction could be granted in support of arbitration, and the parties were left with the submission to the jurisdiction of the English court in the first paragraph. Now, in the light of all of this, Perkins' case was the second paragraph is engaged, there was arbitration, and their primary case about the meaning of the proviso was that uh, the proviso means there must be a treaty providing for the enforcement of court judgments between the UK and Lebanon. Alternatively, if that's not what it means, if there's no treaty that's required, then Perkins submitted that the actual dispute which had arisen between the parties must itself be subject to reciprocal enforcement procedures between the UK and Lebanon. In response to that, Gadar's case was that all that was necessary for the proviso to be satisfied is that there existed domestic laws uh, of the UK and Lebanon which permitted the enforcement of court judgments and those laws were substantially or functionally equivalent. So, what were the principles that uh, the court would apply in determining these issues? Well, they're relatively straightforward. There's no dispute about the jurisdiction of the English court to grant an anti-suit injunction to restrain a breach of an English arbitration agreement under Section 37 of the Senior Courts Act. Nor is there any real dispute about the governing principle, which is that ordinarily the English court will grant an anti-suit injunction to restrain a breach of an arbitration or jurisdiction clause unless the party suing in the non-contractual forum can show strong reasons for suing in that forum. Now, the Supreme Court in a recent case called Ust Kamenogorsk emphasized that bearing in mind the caution that must be exercised in respect of injunctions against foreign proceedings, the court requires a high degree of probability that there is an arbitration agreement which governs the dispute in question. So what that means in practice is certainly on an interim anti-suit injunction application and there is a dispute about the scope of the relevant clause, the English court is going to grasp the nettle and will simply decide that question of construction. In terms of the principles of interpretation, contractual interpretation that are applicable, well, we're all familiar with the principles that were recently summarised uh, by the Supreme Court in Arnold of Britain and Wood versus Capita, and those principles are applicable. There was a suggestion in the case that the principles applicable to dispute resolution clauses, uh, adumbrated by Lord Hoffman in the Fiona Trust case, that those added something in, in particular when one's concerned with a dispute resolution clause. I have to say for myself, uh, it's not clear to me what those uh, principles add to what we now know of the general contractual uh, principles, perhaps other than 
what one colloquially calls the one-stop uh, principle, but as we know from many dispute resolution clauses, sometimes one's driven uh, not to conclude that there is a, a one-stop shop that was intended. So uh, now we turn to the judgment, and I'll flick back to, um, if I can, to the clause, so you have that in mind. So, as between the two competing meanings of the proviso to the arbitration agreement, Mr Justice Bryan, uh, who decided this case, he held that the true meaning was that it did require the existence of a bilateral or multilateral treaty which provided for the enforcement of the court judgments between the UK and Lebanon. And where such a treaty did not exist, the arbitration agreement was engaged. Now, I think what, what, what's in, important is, is really understanding the reasoning by which Mr. Justice Bryan uh, uh, arrived at that conclusion. His primary reason was that this meaning was the only ordinary and natural meaning of all of the words in the proviso. Uh, a key word that he honed in on was the word reciprocal in reciprocal enforcement procedures. Now, the dictionary meaning of that word is uh, mutual, and that was, in his view, consistent with the contemplation of a binding treaty on the relevant enforcement procedures. What's perhaps interesting is that the judge was not only willing to resort to traditional dictionaries like the Oxford English Dictionary, but he also cites in support of his view uh, the meaning of the word reciprocal given on Google.com, which, of course, reinforces the wisdom uh, for all lawyers always to ask Google. But the judge also placed emphasis on the word between, between the UK and Lebanon, and he thought that that was a key indicator that a treaty between the states was contemplated by the clause. The fact that the clause referred to the UK, which of course, as lawyers we know, comprises three jurisdictions, and not merely England, also supported the judge's conclusion because that provides another indication that a treaty between the states was contemplated by the clause. And um, the uh, focus, I think there's an indication, or one can derive an indication from that, the use of the word UK, that um, the focus of the clause is the treaty between the two states, UK and Lebanon, and not the procedures that existed in England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and the Lebanon. And uh, so this is uh, perhaps unlike some of the cases that we've seen on governing law clauses where the English court is quite willing to interpret UK as in effect meaning or being synonymous with England. So those are the textual uh, reasons why uh, Brian Jay uh, came to this conclusion. But I think he also was uh, very... Uh, 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 very much persuaded uh, and his view reinforced by considerations of commercial common sense and reasonableness. Now, first, he reasoned that the scheme that was produced by uh, the meaning that he accepted resulted in the parties either obtaining the benefit of a judgment enforceable by a binding treaty, because that would be the position if you had uh, 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 the, uh, the relevant treaty between the UK and Lebanon, or you have an arbitration award which can be enforced all around the world. And I think in this regard, it's rather interesting that uh, the judge wasn't adversely influenced by the fact that at the time of entry into the distributor agreement in 1990, Lebanon actually hadn't, at that point in time, become a party to the New York Convention. And the judge considered that the New York Convention was simply an aid to enforcement, but it didn't undermine the fundamental point that there was still the ability to enforce uh, via local procedures, uh, any arbitral award around the world. The judge was also persuaded that the ordinary meaning of the proviso provided the parties with a certain speedy and simple means of determining whether they're obliged to uh, litigate or arbitrate, because a party need do no more than check whether a treaty between the UK and Lebanon exists. In his view, this was a business-like construction which meets the reasonable commercial expectations of rational businessmen uh, applying the principles in um, Fiona Trust, uh, Arnold and Britain, and Wood Capita. 
The alternative meaning, according to the judge, would involve obtaining detailed and potentially controversial legal advice on the law of the two jurisdictions, and as the detailed analysis of the law in the two jurisdictions in the Gadar case reveals, this would not have been a clear and simple or certain analysis. And the judge concluded, for that reason, that the alternative meeting that Gadar had advanced would not be a commercial or business-like interpretation. So having held that the proviso required the existence of a treaty on the reciprocal enforcement of court judgments between the UK and Lebanon, and there being no such treaty, the court concluded that the dispute fell within the arbitration clause, and there was no reason not to grant an interim injunction. The judge also considered Perkins' alternative meaning, and although it wasn't necessary for his decision, he indicated that he was minded to accept that submission as well. And so what, what that involved is that if uh, a treaty wasn't actually required by the proviso, it still requires the, ex the existence of reciprocal enforcement procedures between the UK and the Lebanon in relation, not in general terms, but to the actual dispute that was before the court. And the judge rejected Gadar's submission that just the mere existence of general court procedures in the UK and Lebanon would be sufficient, even though they may not apply to the instant uh, dispute. Uh, on the evidence, uh, the judge held that there were no reciprocal enforcement procedures between the UK and Lebanon in relation to this particular dispute because no Lebanese judgment could be enforced in England in relation to this dispute because in the eyes of, the, uh, of English law, the Lebanese court simply did not have jurisdiction. There was no submission, there was no agreement, uh, uh, and so no basis under English common law to regard the Lebanese court as having jurisdiction over Perkins. And secondly, the, um, any English judgment applying English law to the dispute that couldn't be enforced in Lebanon because the evidence of Lebanese law was that the Lebanese court would regard such a judgment which didn't apply the mandatorily applicable Lebanese law as being unenforceable on the grounds that it would be contrary to public policy. So th that was the resolution of the dispute that was actually before the court, but rather interestingly, the court then went on to consider, uh, 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 albeit obiter, uh, Perkins further argument, further alternative. In the event that the arbitration clause had not been engaged, then Perkins wanted to say, well then we're within the jurisdiction clause. And uh, Perkins' submission was that Perkins would still be entitled to an anti-suit injunction on the ground, if it had invoked the jurisdiction of the English court, on the basis that it would be a breach of the first paragraph of the clause uh, for Gadar to continue the Lebanese proceedings. Now, the judge didn't hear full argument on this because, of course, Perkins had to elect whether to invoke the arbitration clause or the jurisdiction clause, and understandably, they invoked the arbitration clause and had an arbitration claim, so they didn't. Uh, issue a claim form uh, seeking to invoke the jurisdiction of the English court. But this raises this rather vexed question about whether pursuit of uh, proceedings in a non-contractual forum can amount to a breach of a jurisdiction clause which is not stated to be, or not expressly stated, to be exclusive. And uh, Mr. Justice Males, as he then was, uh, looked at this question in a case called BMP and uh, Anchorage. And uh, uh, I've given the citations in the, in the handout. And he was faced with a rather similar issue, which involved this argument as to whether or not a relevant clause for the purposes of determining whether or not an anti-suit injunction would be granted was exclusive or non-exclusive. Interestingly, in, in the BNP case, because there'd been a lot of litigation in the US, and there was lots of evidence, in the expert evidence in the US, as to what the meaning of the relevant clause was, and Mr. Justice Mayles had the benefit of all of this. So the arguments he, were, he was faced with in England were not only advanced by counsel, 
but also by reference to expert evidence uh, exchanged between Lord Collins and Professor Briggs, no less. Uh, and a lot of the evidence uh, was, uh, or a lot of the debate was by reference to a distinction that was uh, argued about as to whether or not the submission to the jurisdiction of the English court was transitive or intransitive. Now, Mr. Justice Males's response to this detailed uh, debate and this distinction was to confess uh, that even with the benefit of a university education, the distinct distinction seemed to him to be so elusive that it escaped him altogether. Instead, uh, Mr. Justice Males preferred to ask whether the commencement and pursuit of foreign proceedings were things which the party had promised not to do. And his conclusion was that, it, with a clause in relatively similar terms to the Godard clause, uh, his conclusion was that once a party had invoked the jurisdiction of the contractual forum, it made no sense to interpret the relevant clause as permitting the other party to continue to pursue proceedings in a non-contractual forum. And Mr Justice Bryan was inclined uh, to follow that approach and hold that the jurisdiction clause precluded the Lebanese proceedings if that would have been necessary. Now that approach may not be possible to adopt if the clause that you're concerned with expressly acknowledges an ability of a party to pursue proceedings in a non-contractual forum. And we see these types of clauses in lots of banking and finance uh, documents. And there's an example of a case, well-known case, the Deutsche Bank and Highland case, where um, there was such a clause and uh, no argument seems to have been uh, uh, made that there was a breach of that clause by proceeding in Texas. Instead, the argument uh, for the anti-suit injunction turned on whether or not the foreign proceedings were vexatious or oppressive. Uh, I think that ve whether uh, anti-suit injunctions can be granted on the grounds of vexation or oppression is certainly a topic for another day. And so on that note, I'm going to turn the mic over to Richard. Richard Law is going to follow up on that, the second half on anti-suit injunctions. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Richard and Jasbir. In particular, no thanks for raising expectations. I'm sorry to tell you that I couldn't find much that Bob Marley had to say about anti-suit injunctions. Um, but... Um, I'm going to try and focus on some practical points that I hope are relevant for those either applying for or resisting anti-suit injunctions and based in particular on recent experiences I've had in a number of cases that are anti-suits. Um, and although there are lots of issues, obviously, uh, that may be relevant in anti-suits, they tend to fall into two groups. The first group is looking to see, and this, this by the way, is contractual type anti-suits rather than the vexatious oppressive ones, but the first is to see whether you can show to the right degree of probability that there is a clause um, that entitles you to rely on a jurisdiction clause or London arbitration clause. Jasper has spoken a little about that. And um, the second is what happens or doesn't happen and the relevance of uh, the foreign proceedings, because obviously, uh, by definition, most anti-suits are uh, invoked in order to stop foreign proceedings. And the theory is quite simple, uh, if you read the books, that as soon as you see your counterpart to the contract going off and starting foreign proceedings, or even as soon as they threaten to do so, you go off to the English court and get an anti-suit injunction, a remedy that's been described in some of the cases as relatively easy and cheap. Now, in practice, in my experience, it's not as simple as that because someone who's considering applying for an anti-suit injunction, uh, first of all, by necessity, may have to engage in the foreign proceedings. 
uh, and there are significant risks if they don't. And secondly, the anti-suit remedy itself in practice is not something to be undertaken lightly. And of course, they can be easy and cheap, but very often they involve contested hearings, often more than one, a lot of preparation and a great deal of expense. Uh, so I'm just seeing if I'm going in the right direction. And the answer is yes. Um, so what is the context of these factors? Uh, and what happens overseas is usually said to be relevant in the context of either delay or submission to the jurisdiction abroad or comity. And there is a somewhat arid debate about whether those factors are general discretionary factors or whether they form part of the strong reason factor or good reason factor that's articulated in the leading cases. Uh, and that uh, debate is um, fleshed out in the excellent new edition of uh, Tom Raphael's book on anti-suit injunctions, but I'm not going to dwell on it there. It's of very little practical importance uh, what label you put them under. So um, what is the problem that we're addressing here? Well, if you're applying for an anti-suit injunction or considering doing so, but your counterparty has started proceedings in the courts of Ruritania, what do you do about those proceedings? Of course, the answer is that it depends on all the facts, but there are a number of patterns that emerge. First of all, you might do nothing. You might take a calculated strategic move that the best thing is to ignore the proceedings altogether. That certainly eliminates any risk of being said to submit to them, but in practice it may be foolish or ill-advised. And in particular, it risks uh, the obvious consequence that there will be a default judgment against you in those proceedings. <coughs> that may not, of course, be enforceable or it may not be recognized in the English court by virtue of section 32 of the CJJA. But if it's enforceable somewhere else, that not, that's not much comfort. So you may simply not want to ignore it. If you engage, though, what's the risk? Well, first of all, engaging, whether on a jurisdiction challenge or otherwise, may take a lot of time. And that time may disentitle you, or be said to disentitle you, for injunction before the English court. Secondly, what you do in the foreign proceedings, however careful you are, may be said to be a voluntary submission to the jurisdiction there. And that is a factor which may weigh heavily against the grant of an injunction here. And thirdly, there's this rather vague notion that's debated in a number of the cases of comity. The idea basically is this. If the foreign proceedings are started first and the courts there consider that they have jurisdiction, and that the most convenient forum is there, then it may be difficult to persuade the English court, even if it has jurisdiction, that it should emphasize it. So in the remainder of the time I've got, I'm going to go through those three factors um, in a little more detail and then finish with something slightly different. So, the starting point, the angelic grace, very familiar territory, and Lord Justice Millet's um, formula, basically, which says you should throw away the old ritual incantations. You should grant anti-suits unless the, there is good reason not to. And there's, again, a rather arid debate about whether it's good reason or strong reason, which was the preferred formulation in Richard's case, Donahue and Armaco, I mean, by which I mean he was judge at first instance, if I recall correctly, it went to Supreme Court. That doesn't really matter. But what's quite interesting is that in the uh, Angelic Grace case, uh, the injunction was granted after rejection of a submission that you shouldn't 
actually get an anti-suit junction unless you do challenge jurisdiction abroad first. That was rejected, but matters have moved on now, and, and the received wisdom now is that actually if you do challenge jurisdiction abroad rather than bring an anti-suit injunction, that may be seen as the reverse of comity, and both the delay and the submission factor and the comity factor may weigh against you. Um, so, first of all, delay. Uh, and losing cases is an occupational hazard at the bar. This is a case I felt uh, particularly strongly about. Um, uh, but in any event, in the Kishore, great example of me failing to persuade Mr. Justice Paul Walker that the concept of delay and degree of advancement of foreign proceedings were relevant. In other words, what had happened in that case, my clients were the ship owners, uh, they contended that the Bill of Lading incorporated a London arbitration clause, uh, but cargo interests sued, as is so often the case in the Chinese courts, and we decided to challenge jurisdiction on the basis that the, um, there was incorporation, and it took a long time to challenge the jurisdiction. And we said, well, what you're really concerned with is not delay in absolute terms, but, but how far the foreign proceedings are advanced. So if there's a long delay just because the Chinese courts take a long time to decide, it's nevertheless reasonable to wait for them to decide that. And although there were other factors, that basic argument was rejected uh, and we were denied an anti-suit on that basis. And since those cases, there have been other authorities which again emphasize the importance of delay in its own right, uh, including the, particularly the Echo Bank case in the Court of Appeal, which is an interesting and important judgment of a number of aspects of anti-suit. But the problem is you still don't get any hard and fast rule. When I say it's a problem, it's obviously a desirable aspect of the discretion, but it means as an applicant, you're not ever going to be quite sure how long you can delay without risking it being held against you and disentitling you to. And as a defendant, you conversely don't know uh, with any confidence whether you can rely on a particular delay of two months, six months, one year as being too much. So that's one factor, and these factors are all related for obvious reasons, because they all arise of what does or doesn't happen in the foreign court. Next factor, submission to the jurisdiction. Uh, and this contains a number of traps for the unwary, uh, and the test is usually couched in, in whether the submission to the foreign court was truly voluntary. Now that might be said by a pedant to be tautological, but the test is set out there. And it's not always easy to buy in practice, particularly in some foreign courts. You can't just challenge jurisdiction. You have to do a rolled up uh, response that uh, includes juris what your case is on jurisdiction and merits. Um, and again, it's a question of discretion, not absolute law. And again, it's got fuzzy edges, so there are these dicta that say what you actually look at is whether English law would regard it as a submission to the jurisdiction. You don't just go and do a minute analysis of the uh, white book or equivalent in the foreign jurisdiction. But that's not totally irrelevant. And as was said in the Rubin case, it requires a broader approach. So a case that I've just been involved in, uh, in which we're just awaiting judgment, there was a lot of submission and evidence about the effect of what we did or didn't do in various sets of proceedings in the US, some of which are in the state court, some of which are in the federal court. And there's no real parallel here to that bifurcated system. So you have to translate it into the English context. But then what exactly is a submission to the jurisdiction? So the Williams and Ginn case was a example, rare example of Mr. Justice Bingham being um, uh, slapped down or at least overturned by the House of Lords because he held that even if you apply for a, a, a challenge to the jurisdiction but at the same time apply for a stay, well, that's a submission to the jurisdiction. Rather harsh, and the House of Lords then was said, no, you uh, draw um, 
distinction between invoking the jurisdiction of the foreign court in order to see if it's got jurisdiction and invoking it on the merits. Um, and so the test that's usually applied, again, from that case and others, is a step in the proceedings only amounts to a submission when the defendant's taken some step which is only necessary or useful if the objection to the jurisdiction has actually been waived. So you may think, oh, well, that's all jolly easy uh, if you're working out what you can and can't do in the foreign jurisdiction. But some steps that one might think as a matter of common sense are not voluntary uh, may be deemed to be voluntary. So another problem is what do you do if you want to make a stay in the foreign court? So you're not actually challenging jurisdiction. You're going to the foreign court and saying, well, you may have under your own rules jurisdiction in the narrow sense, but you shouldn't exercise it because I've got a... Uh, English jurisdiction clause or a London arbitration clause, and you should stay those proceedings. And that has been held in itself to be a voluntary invoking of the jurisdiction and sufficient to be a voluntary submission. This was discussed in great detail in a case I was recently involved in, the Pan Ocean uh, case and China base, where it was said my clients had invoked jurisdiction firstly by making a counterclaim in Singapore courts and secondly by applying for a stay on the basis of the very jurisdiction clause uh, we, we wanted to protect and we didn't succeed in a number of reasons but Christopher Hancock undertook quite a detailed analysis of this question and concluded that applying for a stay may well not be a submission to the jurisdiction but even if it was in those circumstances it wasn't anything at very any weight. And the other trap is apparent from the Atlantic Emperor. And in that case, uh, the party that wanted the anti-suit injunction did challenge the jurisdiction of the foreign court. Uh, I think it was the Italian court there. Um, and they failed. So they were then in a dilemma. Should they just walk away from the Italian proceedings um, even though they didn't accept its jurisdiction, or should they contest it on the merits? And they chose to put in a defense on the merits, and the English court said, that is voluntary submission. So you might not think it's very voluntary, where the only alternative is to walk away and get a judgment against you, but that's voluntary, and that disentitled them. But again, it's a question of discretion. And then, finally, comity and... Another quote, this is from um, our former colleague, who of course went on to higher things, Christopher Clark uh, in Echo Bank. And he, in his characteristically wonderful phraseology, said, comity has a warm ring about it. We're not concerned with judicial amour propre. Oh, sorry, that's a mister. It's French. Uh, it should be propre, amour propre, if I can pronounce it correctly. My, the chairman will no doubt but correct me if I don't but with the operation of systems of law. And what Christopher Clarke was saying in his inim inimitable language was this. There are a number of cases that say, if you produce evidence that the foreign judges will be frightfully offended by the thought of an anti-suit injunction being granted, then that's a relevant consideration. And, and uh, Christopher Clarke was saying, quite rightly in my view, well, no, that's not what it's all about. It's not about judges being offended or foreign courts offended. It's about an orderly... Um, uh, operation of systems of law. But it, it's quite easy for submissions of comity to take on a sort of forum convenience uh, in reverse aspect. In other words, you may have your contractual right to be protected, but the foreign proceedings may have gone on and they may say, well, this is a good place to decide it and may involve, as the case I've in recently been involved with, considerations of, of a law that's foreign to the English court but is the, the local law of the foreign court and that it's a jolly good place to decide it and so why if the proceedings have been going on for a bit should the English court come and grant an anti-suit but the fairly clear answer that the English court has given is that it will uh, and of course it's all a matter of discretion but there have been a number of cases where the foreign proceedings have been perfectly valid uh, 
by local jurisdictional rules, by local substantive and conflict rules, and there can be no doubt that the foreign court has jurisdiction under its own terms. A and so you've got two sets of proceedings, English law, where the applicant for the anti-suit uh, is saying, well, actually, this is a, a jurisdictional arbitration clause, the clause the court should uphold, and the other side saying, well, no, why should you? Under our law, it's... Um, quite valid, and they can both be right because the laws of the world are not all uniform on questions of jurisdiction and conflict of law. But the English law is, approach is fairly uncompromising in a series of cases that I put there. They say basically, if as a matter of English conflict and substantive law, it is a London arbitration clause that's valid or an English jurisdiction clause that's valid, we will uphold it notwithstanding that someone else uh, may also have a validly constituted um, claim. Let me finish with something uh, different. Why have I chosen this, even though it's slightly off my general theme? Two reasons. One is because it's a recent and, I think, interesting case. Secondly, because it allows me to take prize for clearly the worst pun <laughs> of this conference. And this is a case called the Guang Rong, otherwise known as Clear Lake and Qing Da. Um, and I have to say that my, um, what I hope is suitably mild criticism of one aspect of this case, uh, sh I should disclose that I, the other case I was involved in is related to this, so I do have a slight ax to grind. But the point is, this was a case where uh, it would take a very long time to go into facts, but allegations of fraudulent scheme to import um, oil into China. This, uh, the allegations leveled principally against Gunvor, well-known commodity trader, and an interlocking web of contracts of the usual type. But the point that was posed in brief was, first of all, a relatively simple one, which is where you've got a jurisdiction clause between A and B, uh, it clearly stops the parties taking action against uh, each other in breach of that, but what about if one of them takes action against a third party? Is that a breach of the clause or not? And that, the analysis there is relatively orthodox. You look at the clause as a matter of construction and, and does it cover that? And so in that case, uh, it was relatively straightforward for one of the parties to uh, have an anti-suit injunction. The norm, more novel part, though, came when a party that was not party to any jurisdiction clause, sought an injunction, um, and this was a charter party chain, uh, and I, I, I appreciate that it may not be particularly clear without taking time that I don't have to go in the facts, but this was essentially where party, not party to any jurisdiction clause, was um, in, held entitled to prevent proceedings in Singapore against another party in tort. And this was labelled by the judge as something that he could do under the oppressive and vexatious head, even though obviously the contractual basis could not be invoked. And it was said that the claims in tort were a procedural maneuver and a manipulation. Now, there may obviously be extreme cases where bringing claims in tort may be some device that is wholly artificial, but, but I, I fear that the value of our uh, anti-suit injunction may be debased if every time a party seeks to bring claims in tort that are not caught by a contractual clause, the judge may say, well, actually, on a sort of forum basis, it would be more convenient if they were brought here because there's a related jurisdiction clause, therefore I'll grant an anti-suit junction. I personally think that that is a step too far, and the judge recognized that it was novel. Um, so on uh, that note, I will leave you with those thoughts on practical issues on aspects of anti-suit injunction, and I hope I haven't overstepped my time, but I will stop now. Thank you. Jonathan Dawid is going to talk about 
state immunity and arbitrations. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so when I, when I submitted the title of this talk, I didn't realize that state immunity was going to be a hot topic in the sense that we now have uh, heads of government in, in this country and across the Atlantic uh, apparently thinking that they are immune from uh, jurisdiction. Um, Donald, Boris, if you're in the audience, don't get too excited. You're immune, but only in front of the courts of other countries. So, yes. A little recap on, on state immunity. Um, of course, state immunity doesn't apply only to arbitration. It applies uh, to litigation as well. Um, but in the context of an arbitral process, it can come in at various stages, uh, jurisdiction, um, registration of an award, enforcement of an award, and in the course of arbitral proceedings, any peremptory orders that the tribunal might give. Um, for the purposes of, of this talk, I'm going to focus on jurisdiction, including in the context of um, enforcement, but if anyone's very keen, there's a couple of uh, cases I list at the end of the handout, uh, which you might look up. brief um, historical overview, the traditional approach to state immunity um, a common law is effectively one of absolute immunity. Um, the English courts took the approach that um, acts of a foreign state um, could not be pleaded um, before them. Now it's true that recently Lord Sumption said in the Ben Carbouche case that um, even a common law immunity was restricted to what sovereigns did in their capacity as such. Uh, but in any event, things have moved on since then. Uh, the first move away from the uh, traditional approach was seen in 1972 with the European Convention on State Immunity. That, um, before you get excited, it's nothing to do with the EU, so it uh, is going to remain in effect whatever happens uh, in Brussels today. Um, it's a Council of Europe instrument. It's also only got eight, eight signatories, or at least eight countries which both signed and ratified it, so it's of, of somewhat uh, limited direct application. It, it's most interesting because it was the precursor to the uh, 1978 State Immunity Act, uh, which is the most important piece of English legislation on this topic. Uh, since then, there's been a few uh, more international developments which are listed up on the screen. Um, the UN Convention was being signed by the UK, but it's not ratified, uh, so I don't think we need to worry about that yet. And as for customary international law, um, again, if... if if you're a girly SWAT, you can look, at, look up this case. It's quite interesting, but I don't think it affects the English position. So looking first at the European Convention, Article 12 deals with arbitration. As I said, this convention has got um, eight countries which have ratified it, if you're interested. Um, in addition to the UK, there are Austria, Belgium, Cyprus, Germany, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. And what you'll notice from Article 12 is that while it refers to uh, a state which has agreed to submit to arbitration, um, not being able to claim immunity in respect of proceedings as set out in little a, little b, and little c, there's no mention there of enforcement. And indeed, the Council of Europe published an explanatory note on the convention, and in respect of articles 12, it says, um, it should be made clear that proceedings concerned with the enforcement of arbitral awards are outside the scope of the convention. So 
according to the convention, um, if you've got an arbitral award or you're taking arbitral proceedings involving a foreign state, you can go to the English courts and you can ask them to rule on validity of the arbitration agreement. You can ask them for rulings on the procedure. You can even ask them to set aside the award, but according to the convention, at least, what you can't do is say um, that the English courts are entitled to enforce the award. As I said, things moved on in 1978, and we have the State Immunity Act, section nine of which deals with state immunity in arbitration. And it, it's very similar to uh, what we just saw under the European Convention, uh, section 91, where a state has agreed in writing to submit a dispute which has arisen or may arise in arbitration, the state is not immune as respects proceedings in the courts of the United Kingdom which relate to the arbitration. Now you might think that since arbitration always requires the parties to agree to arbitrate, um, section 91 is a statement of the obvious, but of course there are complications which arise. Um, for example, what is a state for this purpose? Uh, what does it mean for a state to agree to arbitration in writing? Uh, what is meant by proceedings related to the arbitration? And I will come back to some of those later on. Section 9.2, you'll notice, uh, makes clear that there is no exception from state immunity in the case of interstate arbitrations. Just note that does not apply, of course, to arbitrations between states and non-state parties under interstate instruments, such as a bilateral investment treaty, those are, are still um, within the scope of section 9.1. As for enforcement, the State Immunity Act differs somewhat from the European Convention. Section 13.2b provides that the property of a state shall not be subject to any process for the enforcement of an arbitration award, but it is subject to exceptions. Um, section 13.3 allows you to enforce against a state with the consent of a state. Uh, funnily enough, that doesn't seem to happen very often. So there's much more litigation over section 13.4, um, which is the key exception to immunity from enforcement uh, in this jurisdiction, and that's that if you've got an award, you can enforce it against um, commercial property. And there, there's a somewhat confusing double negative towards the end of this clause, bringing in um, the European Convention and, and section 10 of the State Immunity Act, but essentially all that means is that even if you're dealing with a party which is subject to the convention, and as we've seen, the convention says it doesn't apply to enforcement, you can still enforce against commercial property, um, provided it's not uh, a shipping claim, and shipping claims have got their own rules, uh, which I won't get into. So, coming on to some more recent jurisprudence, the first case I'd like to talk about is uh, Tatneft versus Ukraine. Now, this was um, an unsitral arbitration originally. Tatneft is a Russian company. It claimed that Ukraine had expropriated um, shares in a subsidiary, and um, it won the arbitration. Um, I've, I've left the amount blank, but it was actually $212 million, which were awarded in 2014. This led to um, worldwide litigation. Uh, first of all, Ukraine applied to the French courts to have the award set aside. That's because it was a French-seated arbitration. Um, they failed at the first instance because apparently there's a rule in France that you, you can't challenge an award unless you pay up. 
and Ukraine is now challenging that law as it applies uh, in a state immunity context. Tatneff then applied to the American courts. Um, the American courts stayed proceedings pending what happened in France. Tatneff applied to enforce in Russia. Um, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, at first instance, the Russian court decided that Ukraine was uh, Ukraine was right and, and that the Russian company should not be allowed to enforce, uh, <laughs> but that was overturned on appeal. So Tatneft has an enforceable um, arbitration award in Russia, which it can enforce against Ukrainian assets in Russia. Obviously, the problem there is you've got to find Ukrainian assets in Russia, which Russia accepts are Ukrainian and not Russian. So that led in April 2017 to Tatnev taking proceedings in the English courts, and it issued an arbitration claim form um, applying for judgment to be entered in terms of the award and for permission to enforce the award, and, and that application was made under the Arbitration Act. And Mr. Justice Teard granted the application on the papers. Ukraine applied to set this aside on the basis that it was entitled to immunity and that it had not waived such immunity um, under Section 9 of the State Immunity Act. And, of course, you'll remember that Section 13 of State Immunity Act deals with enforcements, um, but much better to use Section 9 to get rid of the whole basis for enforcement than try and find asset by asset according to whether something is a commercial, uh, commercial property. So why did Ukraine say it was entitled um, to state immunity despite having participated, and Ukraine had fully participated in the arbitration? Well, it was a, a somewhat technical um, bilateral investment treaty point it took. The tribunal had found against Ukraine on grounds that Ukraine had breached what's known as a, the fair and equitable treatment standard. Um, applicable to Russian investors in Ukraine, and Ukraine complained, hang on a minute, that standard is not found in the treaty. And if it's not found in the treaty, it is not uh, something we agreed to arbitrate. And therefore, the fact we have an arbitration agreement with TATNEF doesn't matter, because the actual award is not within the scope of that arbitration agreement. Now, Tatnev's response to this was to say, hang on a minute, if you were going to take this point, you had to take it before the tribunal, and by not taking it before the tribunal, you've waived any jurisdiction arguments based on that. And it argued this by reference to uh, section 67 and 73 of the Arbitration Act. Um, it accepted they weren't directly applicable, but it argued those by analogy. It also uh, had a second string to its bow, which was that in any event, this challenge was really a challenge to the merits of the award rather to jurisdiction. Now, Mr. Justice Butcher, somewhat surprisingly perhaps, decided that Ukraine was not precluded from challenging jurisdiction, even on grounds it failed to take before the tribunal. It wasn't precluded from doing so on enforcement. And it said there was no analogy to Section 67 of the Arbitration Act because the default position under the State Immunity Act is that a state is immune, and a state will be immune unless there is an appropriate exception under the Act. The court has to give immunity, effect to such immunity. And in the context of Section 9, that means the court itself had to be satisfied that there was an arbitration agreement uh, which was the subject of the award. <coughs> in respect of waiver, what Mr. Justice Butcher said, but well, you, you can in principle have waiver, but it would require conduct which clearly indicated that the state was foregoing reliance on a particular point, not just for the purposes of the arbitration, 
but for wider purposes, including any subsequent issues as to state immunity. So it's pretty clear that simply not taking a point, whether deliberately or out of ignorance that there was such a point, does not constitute waiver um, for the purposes of subsequently challenging uh, jurisdiction on state immunity grounds at the enforcement stage. Ms. Justice Butcher, however, went on to find in favor of Tatneft uh, because in fact the challenge uh, to the fair and equitable treatment standards was a merits uh, challenge, he decided, and not jurisdiction. Now, this judgment is, uh, according to Westlaw at any rate, under appeal. So we'll have to see how much of it uh, stands. But if it is upheld, I would suggest that it's quite significant, um, in particular because of what Mr. Justice Butcher says at paragraph 35 of his judgment. Um, and he used very general language. He said, there is nothing in the State Immunity Act which suggests that there can be a foreclosure of points which a state may raise as to the applicability of the immunity afforded by the State Immunity Act by reason of what may have occurred in front of an arbitral tribunal. And basically, that seems to be suggesting that once you get to the enforcement stage, if you have a state party, what happens before the tribunal is treated as, as a blank sheet? You have to start all over again unless, um, as Mr. Justice Butcher went on to say, there had been a very clear uh, indication of an intention to waive jurisdiction um, at a later stage. So moving on to um, another aspect of state immunity, uh, once you've got your arbitration award against a foreign state and you want to enforce it, um, you have to make an application to the court, first of all. Um, and that is governed by part 62 of the CPR, particular rule 62.18, which sets out various steps. Um, this, of course, is relevant to enforcing awards generally, but key key provisions uh, when you're dealing with uh, a state is to note that while you have to issue an arbitration claim form to get such an order, you don't have to serve it. There is discretion on the part of a court whether to order the arbitration claim form to be served. The document that must be served is the court's order giving permission to enforce. And you'll see that it says that if the defendant is out of a jurisdiction, you can serve that order without permission as if it were an arbitration claim form. This interacts with state immunity uh, because section 12 of the State Immunity Act um, provides that any writ or other document required to be served for instituting proceedings against the state shall be submitted, shall be served by being transferred uh, through the FCO. And so that leads to the question, is an order giving permission to enforce an award um, a writ or other document required to be served for instituting proceedings um, when you are dealing with an award against a state? And um, for the moment at least, the answer appears to be no. This is uh, the General Dynamics and Libya case. So um, General Dynamics involved originally an ICC award against Libya for £21 million. Uh, Mr. Justice Tier seems to be landed with most of these, uh, these applications on the papers. He granted an ex parte order to enforce, um, but dispensing with service of the order. And the reason he did so is that Basically, because of a situation in Libya at the time, the, the Foreign Office had said, we don't want anything to do with this. Um, to quote uh, from the judgment, apparently the FCO told the court that serving uh, the order through them would be not straightforward, too dangerous, and even if possible, likely to take over a year. Now, Mr. Justice Mayles then came to deal with uh, 
uh, the matter when Libya applied to set aside uh, the order. And Mr. Justice Mills, as he then was, did set aside the order because he decided that an order giving permission for enforcement was within Section 12 of the State Immunity Act. It was effectively the document instituting proceedings against the foreign state. And because Section 12 was mandatory, the judge had no discretion uh, to dispense with service. The Court of Appeal, however, disagreed. The Court of Appeal decided that, no, the document instituting the proceedings is the arbitration claim form, and the arbitration claim form does not have to be served under the CPR. As such, the court decided that it did have power to dispense with service of an order against a state, service of an order of giving permission to enforce, but it decided that such a power should only be exercised in exceptional circumstances, uh, which circumstances were satisfied in this case. So it allowed the appeal. Personally, I, I think this judgment is rather unsatisfactory for several reasons. And, and the first reason is, of course, it's really happenstance that the CPR doesn't require you to serve the arbitration claim form. Um, and makes it obligatory instead just to serve the order. And it's worth noting on that point that the Singapore High Court has taken the opposite approach to the Court of Appeal. Um, the Court of Appeal spent quite a lot of time trying to justify uh, its position, which somewhat suggests they, they may not have been very sure it was right. Um, they said, well, all right, normally you'd, you, you'd have to serve obviously the claim form of a document instituting proceedings, but here there's been an arbitration, there's been an award issued, so, so it's not going to come as a surprise to the state when it gets an order to enforce the award. So it's less important that there's formal service through the FCO. I don't find that particularly uh, convincing because perhaps the state chose not to take part in the arbitration, perhaps it doesn't know about the award. There's also an inherent tension because the court's test it applied for dispensing with service of such an order, the, the exceptional circumstances test, where did the court get that? Well, it got that out of uh, CPR rule 6.28, sorry, at CPR rule 6.16. And 6.16 provides that the court may dispense with service of a claim form in exceptional circumstances. Now, the court recognized that it's not dealing with a claim form, so really 6.16 doesn't apply, uh, but it's thought that this is nonetheless the appropriate text, and it said it was the appropriate test for policy reasons, Those, the policy reasons being uh, sensitivities over impleding a foreign state. And again, when, when I look at this, I think, well, hang on a minute. Um, the policy reasons are, of course, the policy reasons which underpin the whole of the State Immunity Act. And those policy reasons say that a claim form certainly must be served. You cannot dispense with services of a claim form. And it seems to me very odd for the Court of Appeal to say, well, because of these same policy reasons, we can treat an order giving permission for enforcement as if it was a claim form being served against a non-state, and therefore we can dispense with service in exceptional circumstances, even though had it actually been a claim form, service against a state could not have been dispensed with. What, what, I, what I find particularly odd about this judgment is that the court doesn't seem to have paid any attention to CPR 62.18.2, Oops, I'm going the wrong way here. Which gives the court discretion to require the claim form, the arbitration claim form, to be served on a state. Now that clearly is a document which falls within section 12 of, of the State Immunity Act. And so if a court decides that this is an appropriate case in which uh, an arbitration claim form could should be served, um, then that has to be via the, uh, the Foreign Office. So, you know, one way out of this 
conundrum is, is to say, well, when should the court use its discretion to require the arbitration claim form to be served? One obvious example is when you are dealing with a foreign state. That is consistent with uh, the policy behind Section 12 of the State Immunity Act. It's also, as it happens, consistent with the European Convention, which requires service not through official channels, not only of, of claim forms, but, but of all procedural documents. So I find this a rather unsatisfactory judgment. Um, I'm not sure if it's been appealed to the Supreme Court, but we can only hope. So I'm, I'm out of time, but if you're very keen, there's a couple of other cases dealing with state immunity and arbitration, um, but otherwise I will hand over to Zara. Thank you very much. Well, now then, we're going to come on to issues of alternative service and Hague Conventions, which Zara is going to explain to us. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, now, unfortunately, I um, have come down with a cold, so excuse the croaky voice. I'll do my best to be heard, but if you can't hear me at the back, please do, um, do wave or something so I could um, speak up. Um, I just want to make clear at the outset um, that despite the slightly misleading title, I'm not concerned with alternative service as set out in the Hague Convention itself. So I'm not, I'm not talking about Article 10A, for example, service by post under the Hague Convention. Rather, I'm concerned with um, ser alternative service where one does not want to serve through the Hague Convention or the Hague Convention hasn't been effective in, in ensuring that the documents reach the defendant. Um, so really, um, CPR 6.15, um, 1 and 2, and 6.16, now, hopefully you've got on your chairs, um, other than my slides in minute font, which is um, barely legible, you should have a Word document called CPR Provisions. And I'm going to start with that. Now, this isn't exhaustive, um, because if, for example, you're in an arbitration context, you're looking at slightly different provisions, but I thought it was quite helpful to just quickly run through the relevant CPR provisions in any alternative service case, and so not necessarily a convention case, um, where the defendant is outside the jurisdiction. And we actually start in the middle of the page rather than the top. So application for permission to serve the claim form out of the jurisdiction is the first step, regardless of where you are serving if the defendant is outside the jurisdiction. So even if you want to serve the English solicitors down the road, you still need um, an order for permission to serve the claim form out of the jurisdiction. And within, within that um, CPR provision, 5B um, sets out that um, the court where, where the court gives permission to serve a claim form out of the jurisdiction may also give directions about the method of service. Um, then we come to methods of service, 6.40 of the CPR, so that's just underneath um, 6.37 on um, the separate handout. Um, and that sets out the provisions for service to honour party out of the United Kingdom. And these provisions, if you can comply with them, obviously don't require an additional order. And, and there you have um, at three... B and C, sorry, at 3A, um, you've got service in accordance with the service regulation, service through foreign government, judicial authorities, British consular authorities. Then you've got um, service of the claim form, other documents on the state. And then by a method permitted by a civil procedure convention or treaty, which would include the Hague Convention, um, any other method permitted by the law of the country in which it is to be served. And finally, subsection four, nothing in paragraph three or in any court order authorizes or requires a person to do anything which is contrary to the law of the country where the claim form or other document is to be served. So in situations where you can't serve pursuant to these provisions, 
you then um, can make an application. And the Supreme Court in Abella and Badrani made it clear that it's only in those circumstances that you then require an order for alternative service, that you need permission for alternative service. And there we look at 6.15, where the court has a good reason to authorize service by a method or at a place not otherwise permitted by this part. The court may make an order permitting service by an alternative method or at an alternative place. Again, the Supreme Court in Abella made clear that good reason means good reason. It doesn't have to be more than that. But the court would take into account all the relevant circumstances and would not only focus on one good reason, but would identify if there is a good reason overall taking into account everything. And then um, we've got 6.152. The court, uh, the court may order that steps already taken to bring the claim form to the attention of the defendant by an alternative method or, an alter, or at an alternative place is good service. And then the exceptional um, power within 6.16 to dispense with service in exceptional circumstances. Um, I've also set out 7.5 and 7.6 only because they tend to be relevant in the background, that you do have to serve within six months and if that time is running out because um, the documents have gone off to the central authority for another country and seem to have disappeared, you need to be um, very conscious of making an application to extend the validity of the claim form. Now, of course, I am very conscious that the audience is um, much more familiar with these provisions than I am, given that um, service is very much your forte, um, but I hope that the quick run through will be useful in any event. Um, so back to convention cases. We're still starting in the same place. And um, so the order, the, the power um, to order alternative service is contained within 6.375BI. Um, and the simple point that derives from that, as I said at the outset, um, from the case of Marishan and Kenvet, uh, but it's been repeated in various authorities, is that you need permission to serve out first. And in, on the facts of that case, um, the applicants had actually requested permission to serve out, and um, it was deemed that that wasn't necessary, and it was challenged on that ground. So you do need that order, and now that's the established position. I digress very briefly um, to mention full and frank disclosure because obviously an application for permission to serve out is an application um, that's made ex parte. And if your order for permission to serve out is set aside, then your order for permission to serve by alternative means is also set aside given that it's um, dependent on having the first order in place. So. Um, we see that in a recent case, the Libyan Investment Authority and JP Morgan Markets Limited, where um, the order for um, service out was set aside for material non-disclosure and the order for alternative service was also set aside for that reason. Just a couple of very quick things to bear in mind about um, full and frank disclosure. And again, I, I don't want to digress too much here, but it's the court that decides what is material rather than the parties. And so even if a judgment is made in good faith that something wasn't material um, and the court disagrees, it will still be deemed to be a material non-disclosure. So it's worth being um, extra cautious. And what is relevant when, when the court refers to the applicant being aware of matters which might reasonably have caused the judge to have any doubt whether he should grant permission to serve out, it's the applicant being the lay client. So it's what your client knows um, that's relevant here. And so it's worth making sure that the client understands that anything that may be material to whether they ought to be given permission to serve out um, needs to be disclosed to the court. Now on the facts of this case, the, the facts were quite stark. It's, um, it's not a borderline case because there was um, a limitation period that had been, um, that had expired and um, the Libyan Investment Authority took the view that it could rely on the fact that it couldn't have um, discovered the fraud any earlier than it did. And the court said, fine, you, you, know, you set those facts out to the, court, to the courts and you let the court decide. 
you don't um, hide the fact that there is a, limit, a possible limitation defense against you. So we then come to the context of um, the Hague Convention cases when applying CPR 6.15. And as I set out very briefly at the outset, the test in 6.15 is, is there a good reason? But in Cecil and Beat, the Court of Appeal held that in fact you need exceptional um, circumstances or special circumstances only in the context of a Hague Convention case. And for some time, um, there was a little bit of conflict at um, high court levels, first instance, um, which I haven't, I haven't set out the cases because that conflict has now been resolved about whether exceptional circumstances are only required where you could say that somebody was circumventing the convention, where, for example, um, a state had entered a positive objection to Article 10 being used, which is service by post. Um, so there's a, just, uh, there's a judgment from Mr. Justice Legger, as he then was saying, it's only in those cases that you need exceptional circumstances. But even back then, the weight of authority was that exceptional circumstances were always required in a Hague, in a Hague Convention case. Um, positions now are being um, clarified by the Court of Appeal and Societe Generale, and they um, decided that Cecil and Beat applies generally and is not um, to be limited to cases where there is subversion or an attempt to subvert the Hague Convention. And Longmore LJ essentially um, invited a challenge to the Supreme Court if um, somebody wants to change that because the Court of Appeal held that it was bound by Cecil and Beat to apply this test. So what do exceptional circumstances look like? Um, in Cecil and Beat itself, um, Stanley Burnton LJ um, gave some examples. So he said that service by alternative means may be justified by facts specific to the defendant, where, for example, you are expecting the defendant to try to um, avoid personal service, where that is the only method permitted by the foreign law, or facts relating to the proceedings, as where an injunction has been obtained without notice or an urgent application or notice for injunctive relief is required to be made after the issue of proceedings. Um, and again, the court takes into account all the relevant circumstances. So I've found some examples from relevant, um, sorry, recent case law of um, these different heads, if you like, in, in practice. Um, so first in Marishan and Kemvet, um, the courts, David Foxton QC, um, said that mere delay or expense in serving in accordance with the treaty cannot, without more, constitute an exceptional circumstance or exceptional circumstances. I say without more because delay might be the cause of some other form of litigation prejudice or be of such exceptional length as to be incompatible with due administration of justice. And on the facts of the case, he, ha he held that eight to 10 months was treated as insufficient delay to, to amount to exceptional circumstances. So eight to 10 months on the facts of a standalone claim um, was not exceptional. In BVC and EWF, um, in circumstances when urgent injunctive relief had been obtained without notice, that did amount to exceptional circumstances, and so permission to serve by alternative means was given by the judge. Um, in Jamila, we have an example of where the delay is such that um, it could be assumed that something had gone wrong. And on the facts of the case, the delay had been 16 months. So we've got an example at one end where eight to 10 months are said to not be long enough to be exceptional. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, 16 months was held to be, um, was held to be exceptional, um, sorry, to, to amount to exceptional circumstances. And then finally, in Abenoik Holdings Limited, which I believe that the trial's underway at the moment, or at least is imminent, um, we look at the issue of delay in the context of joinder to existing proceedings. And here there's a distinction between self-standing proceedings, where, as we've seen in Kemba, the court held that eight to 10 months isn't too long, 
Um, whereas in, on the facts of this case, um, new defendants were being joined to an existing um, set of proceedings that was due to go to be in trial um, in October 2019, and this application had been heard in December 2018. Judgment was given in January 2019, granting permission to serve by alternative means on the London solicitors of um, these defendants. Um, and the court looked at the litigation prejudice of essentially derailing the timetable of the pre-existing uh, proceedings. Um, and the delay in that case was about one year long, the estimated delay, and it said that that was too long. So the order um, granting permission to serve by alternative means was upheld in this judgment on that basis. Finally, in Flotia, that's um, the last example I'm providing. This is the judgment from Mr. Justice Leggett that I referred to earlier, in which um, he didn't think that exceptional circumstances were necessary. But he said if they were necessary, then he would hold that on the facts of, this, of that particular case, there were exceptional circumstances. The delay on the facts of the case was approximately eight months, and that was held to be exceptional because it was very closely related to a number of existing arbitration proceedings that were already underway. So again, it falls within um, this idea of being joined, although it wasn't being technically joined to proceedings in the way that the previous case was, because it was very closely related to those proceedings, um, Mr. Justice Leggett held that that would amount to exceptional circumstances. The moving on from the test um, to be applied by the court, um, I wanted to touch briefly on appeals in this context. Um, and I've got a quotation here from um, the judgment of Lord Clark in Nabella and Badrani, where he explains the nature of a decision on, um, of an order under section 6.151 and 6.152. He makes it clear that this is, this is not an exercise of discretion, but rather a value judgment based on the evaluation of a number of different factors. Um, he goes on to say, in such a case, the, read, the readiness of an appellate court to interfere with the evaluation of the judge will depend on all the circumstances of the case. The greater the number of factors to be taken into account, the more reluctant the appellate court should be to interfere with the decision of the judge. As I see it in such circumstances, an appellate court should only interfere with, the decision, with that decision if satisfied that the judge erred in principle or was wrong in reaching the conclusion which he did. Um, so that's essentially a very brief run through um, alternative service in a Hague Convention case. But before I end um, my talk, I just wanted to touch quickly on Article 15 of the Hague Convention. And Article 15 of the Hague Convention deals with um, default judgments, essentially, where the defendant doesn't enter an appearance. It sets out um, in the first paragraph circumstances in which default judgment should not be given. But then it goes on in the second paragraph to say that each contracting state shall be free to declare that the judge, notwithstanding the provisions of the first paragraph of this article, may give judgment even if no certificate of service or delivery has been received, if the following conditions are fulfilled. And then there's three conditions there. Document was transmitted by one of the methods provided for in this convention. A period of time of not less than six months, considered adequate by the judge in the particular case, has elapsed since the date of the transmission of the document, and no certificate of any kind has been received, even though every reasonable effort has been made to obtain it through the competent authorities of the state addressed. And then it goes on to say in the third paragraph, notwithstanding the provisions of the preceding paragraphs, the judge may order in case of urgency any provisional or protective measures. Now, the reason I've brought up Article 15 is because it was relied on um, in uh, Marishan and Kembert as an additional ground to contest um, whether alternative service should be permitted in a Hague Convention case. Um, and the submission's quite an interesting one. So I've got the quotation here of the judge, 
summarising it, Mr. Salzida submitted, and I accept, that the effect of Article 15 is that if Marishan had sought to affect service under the Hague Convention, whilst at the same time taking steps to bring the Section 51 application to Mr. Ivyanchenko's attention, otherwise than by service, it would be open to it to apply to the court for judgment once a period of six months had elapsed from transmission. Um, and I think that this is quite an interesting um, judgment because even though I haven't been able to find any examples of this working practice, so I'd be really interested to hear if any of you have tried it. But what's interesting about it is that these are the circumstances where you can't make an application for alternative service, so you've served through the usual um, means under the Hague Convention. But at the same time, the solicitors had also served through some alternative means without permission. But um, the point is that the proceedings had been brought to the attention of the defendant. And in those circumstances, um, David Foxton QC is um, stating here that you could then, within six months or after six months, make an application for default judgment if um, the defendant hadn't entered, um, sorry, if you haven't, even if you haven't um, served or if service hadn't been affected by that point. And so it seems to be a safety valve in situations where you don't want too much delay, but actually you can't quite make out the um, exceptional circumstances to be asking for alternative service at the outset. Um, now, how it would work in practice is interesting, and, and that's what I couldn't quite see from the case law, because obviously here it's not, it's not that somebody's relying on it to um, dispense with service, it's rather being relied on to support the submission that you shouldn't be giving permission for alternative service um, too lightly in a convention case. And this was um, pointed to as a safety mechanism set out on the face of the convention itself. Now, Article 15, as you may or may not recall from what I just read out, doesn't actually refer at all to bringing the proceedings to the attention of the defendant. Um, but what, it does goes, what the convention does go on to do in Article 16 is give the defendant who wasn't aware of um, the proceedings a right to make an application to set aside the default judgment. So I assume the reference here to making the defendant aware of the proceedings could be um, to make sure that it's an effective um, remedy because otherwise they'd just come back and, and have the judgment set aside. But in the time we've got for questions and answers, I'd be um, very interested to hear if anybody has tried this, um, if you've had any success, um, or whether it indeed is um, a useful safety mechanism for, for your clients so that they don't have to wait eight to 10 months or longer um, while service is being affected under the convention. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, those are all the topics for today. Uh, and th they've covered a very wide area. And it seems to me a good idea to send you away with some questions to ponder and perhaps to talk about over the drinks that you're going to have, I hope, downstairs. Uh, in the uh, Vuliami room. So here are my five suggested questions. There may be many others uh, that you might like to think about. The first is, raising, rising out of Helen's uh, presentation, how do we stop these mammoth jurisdiction hearings, which surely can't be good for the reputation of English courts and lawyers both in terms of time and expense. Secondly, is this idea of reflexive, in inverted commas, rules that have been developed in the English courts, simply the English courts answer to what it sees as restrictions or limitations in Brussels I revised and Lugano, or is it something that is wider? Thirdly, arising particularly out of Charlotte Thomas's presentation. Imagine we leave uh, the European Union. Imagine uh, that we're after the transitional period. 
and that uh, there's not going to be a continuation of our taking part in Brussels One Revised or Lugano. We're a third party so far as the EU uh, regulations and Lugano are concerned. Uh, if uh, then there's an English jurisdiction clause in a contract and there's an attempt to start proceedings in France using uh, Brussels One Revised, Article 4, uh, and the situation is not within Article 33 and 34, so that there won't be any possibility of getting a stay in France, could there be any room for an anti-suit injunction, and would it be any use if it was attempted, uh, if sought in this country? Fourth question for you, should the rule that state assets cannot be used for enforcement purposes, even when a state has engaged in commercial activity and agreed to submit to a, an arbitration regime, still a good one in today's commercial world? And lastly, what do you think is the difference between a value judgment and the correct exercise of a discretionary power, which is something which struck me in Zara's presentation. Well, those are for you to think about. Meanwhile, may I ask you to join me in thanking all the speakers we've had this afternoon for all the hard work that they put into these presentations for you today. Thank you.